exactly what we were getting into when we came. 2,000 marching Negroes invaded your city. This was a group that we did not know. They had a philosophy that was not familiar to the local people. People would call them nigger lovers, you know, call them communists. Oh, it was an evil place. You would read things like Reverend George, he ain't nothing but an agitator. What was happening at Cornell was happening in a vacuum. It was the backwater of the civil rights movement. It still doesn't have its place in history, and I don't suppose it ever will. There was uh, Cornell with that kind of a beacon light for people who believed in racial equality. There's a simple farm in South Georgia where racism and religion once collided. How ironic that this place that embraces love, tolerance, and sharing could also be a place that has spawned fear, hatred, and violence. You may have never heard the name, but this mostly unknown place has a significance that stretches around the globe and across time. I'm Andrew Young. When I first heard of Koinonia Farm, I was a pastor in South Georgia, immersed in the civil rights movement. Koinonia was a place where even some civil rights workers were afraid to go. It was so controversial that I never visited. Why? Simply because it was a place where blacks and whites were living and working together as equals. That may seem innocent in the 21st century, but for much of the 20th century, race integration was not only socially taboo, it was often against the law. Those who advocated integration literally placed their lives in danger. This is the story of Koinonia Farm, a story that begins with a gentle activist named Clarence Jordan. He was saying things that were unpopular. He was uh, challenging conventional wisdom. When uh, Clarence Jordan would stand up and say uh, things like, uh, should we be dropping bombs on people? How can you say you love somebody if you're gonna be bombing them? The thing that pricked people the most uh, here in Southwest Georgia was the consistent way that Cornelia kept saying black folks are as good as white folks. So I think uh, Cornelia did serve as a, a briar or as an irritant in society. Southwest Georgia in the 1940s. Two societies, one white, one black, both shackled by a system of segregation so deeply embedded in the culture that few even thought to question it. In America, in the 1940s, if you were black, you had to pay a walking around tax. The police would harass you if you were walking around. Into this white-dominated society, a briar grew with little notice. Cordonia Farm was created in 1942 as an experiment in Christian living. Its founder was a preacher and Greek scholar named Clarence Jordan. Born in 1912 to the family of a prominent banker in Talberton, Georgia, Clarence Jordan lived a privileged life. Like other white Southern boys, he attended church regularly and played a variety of sports at school. He was shy, but never backed down from a verbal fight, earning the nickname Grump for his serious attitude. His family thought he might use his verbal skills to become a lawyer. Clarence thought otherwise. Clarence had had everything when he was growing up, and it had bothered him even as a child. But some had and some had nothing. And as he grew older, he decided that he wanted to do something for the poor in the South. Clarence went on to the University of Georgia, earning a degree in agriculture. Initially, his plan was to use that knowledge to help poor black farmers improve their farming techniques. But then he began to feel an overwhelming call to the ministry. He enrolled at the Southern Baptist Seminary in Kentucky, where he earned a doctorate degree in Greek New Testament. So when he went to the seminary, he fell in love with the Greek. 
And in his study of the Greek, he came across the idea of the koinonia. The actual meaning of the word is a commune, or having things in common. What Clarence would do next would embroil him in controversy the rest of his life. Along with his wife Florence and another couple, Martin and Mabel England, Clarence Jordan bought some neglected farmland near America's Georgia to establish his experiment in Christian living. Koinonia Farm was to be a place where blacks and whites would be treated equally and everyone would share their possessions. It became clear to us that God is the father of men irrespective of their race. We agreed that we would hold to that, regardless of the consequences. Gradually, other families joined the Koinonia experiment, including a liberal pastor who brought his family from Green Lake, Wisconsin, Con Brown. We wanted to demonstrate about how people could live together, solve their problems without violence. Koinonia Farm existed in peace nearly 10 years before trouble began. At first, uh, Clarence's own personality carried the day. Um, people were not suspicious. I guess they thought my dad was a bit weird, but other than that, he had some silly, crazy ideas that didn't fit in the South. But he was, I hate to use the word harmless, but that was sort of the way I think that the, the local community saw Koinonia, uh, you know, sort of slightly weird, but nice folks and no, no problems. But once uh, suspicions were aroused by his, for instance, sitting down to a meal with a black farmer, um, then uh, it became very difficult for Koinonia to continue in Sumter County. The first flames of hostility flickered across Sumter County when it became known that Koinonia was paying black and white workers equally. When we had uh, these peak seasons, we would t pay people $4 a day. Farmers around were all sort of forced then to raise the level of, uh, of pay, and that didn't go down very well. The next culture shock came when members of Koinonia brought an Indian student to Sunday service at the little country Rehoboth Baptist Church. It was the summer of 1950, and people of color were not welcome at the all-white place of worship. We took him to church, and people uh, somehow mistook him for a Negro, and uh, the church became incensed, and the following Sunday, uh, a resolution was introduced by the deacons of the church, excluding all who were members of Koinonia from membership in the Rehoboth Baptist Church. That was the first thunderstorm, sort of rumbling of thunder, that said there is tension between this group and the rest of the community in South Georgia. It was just a whole lot of those little things that we knew were running under the current. Um, but we didn't realize that the violence was, was going to come on as it did at all. May 17, 1954. America is stunned by the U.S. Supreme Court's decision outlawing segregation in public schools. It would profoundly impact the people of Koinonia and Sumter County. The Supreme Court made its historic decision on the integration of schools and ordered that that, that decision be implemented with all deliberate speed. Now, when you get to talking to us down there about speed and telling us we got to think, both of those things are rather painful. And uh, it, it set in motion some painful processes, and we began to react. The Brown versus Board of Education in 54, start, Brown 1, starts out the whole thing. And that got the citizens councils and the reactivated Ku Klux Klan people thinking, hey, maybe we do have some sort of threat here, and maybe these harmless folks that are just practicing brotherhood are, are a threat to the Southern way of life. 
The perceived threats immediately generated some bizarre charges against Koinonia. That was the year we decided to have a summer camp for children here. They were black and white and uh, it was quite a, quite a diverse group of children. But before we had any children here, they, they brought an injunction that we could not open the camp because the buildings were a fire hazard. Uh, when it looked like the county it didn't have any charge at all after the health inspector had made his inspection, the county was about to drop it and uh, four farmers asked to intervene in the case saying that they wanted to bring charges, not that the camp would be a health menace, but that it would be a moral menace, that it would endanger the morals of the children who might attend. And um, the reason for it, they said, was that some of the children might see baby pigs being born on the farm. The briar had made its first prick in the local consciousness. So the camp was moved to Tennessee. It would be the last idyllic moments before years of fear and violence. Things began to get bad when Clarence went to Atlanta. March 1956. Clarence Jordan is asked to sponsor the first black applicants to the Georgia Business College in Atlanta, part of the state university system. Daddy being an alumnus of the University of Georgia, they called and said, would he support this application? And actually, he said, I don't know. He said, I want to meet the kids first. Photographers, reporters had been tipped off that this meeting was taking place. And the next morning in the America's Times Recorder newspaper, local man endorses integration efforts for the University of Georgia. There was an almost immediate reaction to Jordan's sponsorship. That's when I was first very scared. I remember one evening, the uh, car came along and it was shooting. People were shooting out of the car over the kid's head. I was here and I remember the flashes from the guns. The kids were so frightened. All of the kids ran in my back door. I was living downstairs. The Jordans were living upstairs. So the kids ran in my back door and under the bed, some of them in the closet, they were just scared to death. From that point on, you just, you just didn't feel good. I mean, you just, you didn't, you was expecting somebody to get killed. You just, you just didn't know. And the Ku Klux Klan, they burned the cross at my mama's house. Yeah, I think then they sat it on fire. We had three children sitting on a bed, reading bedtime stories. Machine gun bullets went in the wall right between their heads, the three of them. Six inches either way would have killed all of them. You know, things happen and you wonder how in the world it could happen like that. white people who may have felt in their hearts that this wasn't right, the local black people who felt that it wasn't right and wanted to do something, they were isolated to some great extent. They had jobs. They had far greater risk to take a stand. And we had to say to some of our dear friends who were uh, black families in the neighborhood, don't worry, you don't feel bad. We understand, you don't need to come over here, you don't need to show your support. The word kind of near in the black community was extinct. You, you, you just didn't use that word. Your parents would sit you down and they say, okay, now these are the places and people you don't associate with. You don't go to kind of near. You don't go drink out them white folk fountain. You don't go to them white folk front door asking for nothing to eat. Oh, it was an evil place. <laughs> that, that was the word that we had. There were bombing incidents. They blew up a, a Cornelia store in Sumter City. They blew up a Cornelia stand that was out on Highway 19 south of Americas. Partners in town were beat up just because they were partners at Cornelia. He had brass knuckles and uh, started hitting me in the face. Uh, subsequently, um, there was a, an economic boycott and no one would buy or sell to Koinonia. My 
My grandfather purchased this land in 1886, I believe. He was a slave. Carranza Morgan was a rarity. He was a black farmer who actually owned his own land. His wife worked at Koinonia, and during the boycott, Carranza would sometimes sneak fertilizer into Koinonia after dark. Well, I was just about afraid of going today. It was just that dangerous. It was just that dangerous, I think, for me. Because I, I went down there some in the day. But you see, I didn't go taking nothing. You understand? <laughs> I wasn't taking nothing on my truck. I'd go down there, my wife was down there. I'd go down there sometime. But uh, see, when you load that truck with fertilizer, with, 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 uh, with those trolls or something, and they come by and see them, say, you probably is involved down there. And see, I don't know. They probably burn across it. Maybe burn across from my door. Well, they didn't ever do it. And I was expected to happen because my wife, at that time, she was working down there. It was a sense of foreboding, I guess, is the best way to describe it, in the whole community. Fear for them, fear for us. The continuing acts of terrorism compelled Clarence Jordan to ask for outside help. In January of 1957, Clarence sent a plea to President Dwight Eisenhower. A community of nearly 60 men, women, and children is facing annihilation unless quick, decisive action is taken by someone in authority. There was no response to the letter for five weeks, and then it was Eisenhower's attorney general who eventually replied coolly. It is only when a law of the United States is violated that federal officers are empowered to act. The attorney general did little but forward Jordan's letter to the governor of Georgia. The state attorney general got involved and, and, and basically sick the GBI, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation on Koinonia. Uh, contributors to Koinonia were investigated. The Sumter County Grand Jury concluded that Koinonia was responsible for the violence itself and was linked to the Communist Party. Leonard Waitsman, a businessman in Americas, served on that grand jury. Now that I look back on it, it was a trumped up thing just to tar and feather uh, corner near. At the center of the investigation was Sheriff Fred Chappell, whom Martin Luther King once called the meanest man in the world. His daughter remembers watching her father at work. And they'd be beating somebody up or slapping somebody, went backhanding. He was great for backhanding people and moving along their teeth. And people back there did that. That was the good old boy white club. You're either white, trash, or niggers. I mean, that's how they looked at it. His feelings about Cornelia, that, that he didn't like the place, that what they were doing was awful, they were living with blacks. They, they said niggers, I don't like that word, but I remember them saying, well, they, they needed that place shot up. So like, if he did not pull that trigger, he definitely pushed it. It got scary, but they never let us get scared. Um, we were told things like, well, you know, if you hear shooting, just drop to the floor. But never in a way of panic. We, I don't think any of us ever felt that. In fact, I never realized that the reason that the wood was stacked around the outside of the house was to stop bullets. While the briar of Koinonia merely pricked some, it made the Ku Klux Klan howl. On February 24, 1957, the Klan held a large rally outside America's. It was a Sunday afternoon, I remember that. Local reporter Rudy Hayes was there. The KKK was having a meeting in front of the Sumter County Fairgrounds. I rushed out to see what was happening, you know. And there was a large number of Klansmen, close to 100, I would have uh, estimated. I sort of got there near the end and uh, saw them in time like this uh, large, tall cross. After the meeting, the Klansmen removed their robes and assembled a 70-car caravan that descended on Koinonia. As I, as I got here, I looked up and I saw two men from the motorcade walking toward the building. And then two men came out from the Koinonia building. And, uh, reminded me of uh, the startup of a football game when the captains from <laughs> two sides were coming up and ready for the coin toss. And they came out and they discussed the sale 
a proposed sale of uh, the Cornier Farm. The Klan made an offer, but it was only half what the farm was worth. They offered $149,000 for the place. We were upsetting the county, and they thought if we moved away, it would be the same as it used to be. Began to find out that how bad it was, so it, it was frightening. And I think it frightened my husband more than it did me, uh, in a sense, because he was with the men during the day, you know, and they would be talking about a lot of the stuff while I would be in their kitchen or something. Some at Koinonia, like Sue Angry and her family, were evacuated to New Jersey. They didn't feel like it was no way that we could be protected there. That it would possibility that they'd come in there and drag us out of there. You know, who knew? A lot of people left. Koinonia Farm struggled down there in very dangerous circumstances, and the local media did not cover those things. Or you'd find these little bitty stories, if you look in the record, that says the roadside stand was blown up, or the sheriff went out to investigate a report of shots. But nobody was getting to the bottom of that story, so the good, the good hearted people of Sumter County were never confronted by the truth. During that era of time, you didn't, you didn't read nothing about coming here except something bad. We felt that by doing what we did in the way of not sensationalizing, that uh, in the long run, it would be better for the people of the community. Are you thinking that if people just knew about it, that yeah. they would understand it? But again, but see, that's a rational approach. And again, you're dealing with an irrational attitude. You know, racism and bigotry are totally irrational. So you could explain from now until the cows come home. And it's, it still would have not done a bit of good because all people could see was color. This was a group that we did not know. They had a philosophy that was not familiar to the local people. And I think most people were actually afraid of this organization that was moving into our county. I did recognize that this was a big moral issue and the biggest that I had ever encountered, except maybe the war. I don't think they are vicious devils. I think they are people with the good and the evil, and it's pulling against them. Uh, they, there is this struggle between an ideal and a, and a tradition that that's exerts a tremendous pull in their lives. Clarence Jordan responded to the threats and attacks the only way he knew how, with a plea for brotherhood and nonviolence. The response? Bullets rip through signs, a gasoline pump and dwellings. Bombs shatter roadside stands, beehives destroyed, pecan and fruit trees chopped down. But the Koinonia story was slowly getting out to the rest of the world. Tonight on Report to the People, we're going to hear a very moving and very disturbing report from the Deep South. It seemed to me that the Koinonia farm story down there in Georgia has as much meaning for us as the story of the non-violent bus strike in Montgomery, Alabama. There in Montgomery, as you recall, it was Negroes who stood their ground. In America, Georgia, it's Southern white people and some two Negroes who are trying to live peacefully in a community that has turned against them. There were two major Klan rallies, several cross burnings, a huge rally in front of the courthouse. But it all came to a head in the middle of the night on Saturday, May 19th, 1957. A white-owned store is bombed in downtown America. It blew the windows out around the square, blew a hole in the sidewalk there. The bomb had been planted in the front of the Bradley store. The people who had the business there dared to sell farm supplies to Cornelia when there was a boycott by the local merchants not to sell anything to Koinonia. People couldn't miss that, and they did not like it, they did not appreciate it, and they weren't gonna tolerate it. I called the FBI and begged them for protection, and the mayor had me to do that, and uh, they wouldn't even talk to us. A few days after the bombing, a group of concerned Sumter County citizens asked to meet with Clarence Jordan at Koinonia. On May 26, 1957, 
the two sides calmly confronted one another. This amazing meeting was captured on audio tape. Charles Crisp, president of a local bank, was the group's spokesman. Some of our people feel that uh, you're out here to create trouble and chaos. Our philosophy is that uh, the first duty of a Christian would be peace on earth, goodwill to men, to, to make uh, brotherly love in the community. Uh, unfortunately, your, your experiment has not done that. It has uh, set brother against brother. It, uh, it has uh, created bitterness. It's created hatred. It's created every emotion that uh, is contrary to my concept of, of Christianity. Well, of course, that's why our forefathers were driven from Europe on the very same lines and why they came to this country, because their practices did offend the people over there, and they wanted a measure of freedom where, where they could be free to worship and as they see fit. The line of battle, if we use that word, has been so drawn here that I don't believe that you, certainly we don't want to see anyone hurt particularly innocent people. The president of the local chamber of commerce, Frank Myers, was one of the businessmen at the meeting. I asked him to leave for the good of the community and themselves. Uh, I don't think that, that part of it was out of line because it was dangerous for everybody. But the fact that I went in itself, I, I regret and uh, I didn't have any guts at the time. I think they were just dedicated people that, um, in, in the eyes of many, they were zealots. Terrorist attacks, economic boycott, back taxes due, insurance canceled, investigated by the state, pressured to relocate. Quinonia stood on the brink of extinction, yet refused to fold. We had a mission that we felt was more important than, than leaving anyway, so we stayed. They were not down there to fight and say, I dare you to challenge the way we live. They were down there with much of a service orientation, um, almost like a Peace Corps mentality. Support from around the country came in the form of $50 pledges from 2,000 people. It was not much, but it was enough for Koinonia to survive aided by Clarence Jordan's spirited disposition. When uh, the Ku Klux Klan and the White Citizens Council had put a boycott on and, and destroyed their farm product business, Clarence, with his unbelievable sense of humor, started this little business of selling pecans and pecan products through the mail. And his advertising slogan was, help us ship the nuts out of Georgia. Clarence Jordan used his humor not only to defuse a tense situation, but also to make a point. Once during the boycott, Clarence asked a downtown merchant to sell him some items. The merchant replied that if Clarence would run an ad in the America's Times Recorder newspaper, renouncing his views on integration, the merchant would sell him anything in his store. Clarence quickly said there must have been some kind of misunderstanding because he had come to the store to buy seed, not to sell his soul. I don't believe Clarence went down there to live a life in scorn of the consequences. I think he went down there as a very passionate, optimistic, um, faith-driven person uh, who thought he could really make a difference in his own home country. And I think he was extremely disappointed and wounded by the reaction he ran into. But what it uncovered was this core of uh, courage and commitment that turned Koinonia Farm into a true demonstration plot. In September 1960, Koinonia took an unusual step. They went to court. The local school board had refused to allow their children to attend America's high school. It was the first time that white children had been denied access to a white high school. The legal stuff reads that we would contaminate the other children because of our parents' religious beliefs. The federal district court ruled for Koinonia but for the children, being a briar would mean years of scorn and rejection.
this gets very difficult for all of us um, because we probably, and I don't want to get into the psychological evaluation of us and how we went through it, but there are probably so many unsettled issues um, that it's very difficult not to talk without crying about it. I remember that my best friend th threw Thalian called and said she just wanted me to know that she would still be my best friend but that she could never speak to me again and that she hoped I would understand that. The first day, I, I guess I, ha I do remember because as we went to lunch, and again this was a beginning of things to come, as we went to lunch, the lunchroom was set up with long banks of tables and I just walked in and sat down beside somebody and instantly the whole lunchroom just People picked up their trays and moved. They, they wouldn't sit next to us. And this went on for the whole four years of high school. There was constant threat. You know, I had food shoved down my face. I, I, you know, I finally got beat up a couple times, or hit a couple times. I can't say beat up. But I got hit several times, you know, with real intentions to hurt. Even at my graduation, I, I thought I was going to get killed. Out of the student body, the three years that I was there, there were maybe two kids who would speak to us who would not call us names. And in fact, I, I don't know my favorite phrase from that time is you goddamn communist nigger loving Watusi Jew. I think we, I got called that regularly. Then it was such a, an odd juxtaposition of got in there Jews, Africans, communists. I mean, anybody that was the target of a hate group we were really the front line of, um, of our parents' belief and, and really were the soldiers on the, on, the, on, the, on the battlefront. The battlefront expanded with African-American students crashing the previously all-white America's high school. As was the case all over the nation, school desegregation took its toll on countless innocent children. Greg Whitcamper ignored the social implications of riding to school with black kids on the first day of integration. When we drove into the, um, the grounds, there's a mob of people, of course, knowing is that this is the first day of integration. Everybody was excited, and rocks and bottles came sailing in. And luckily, nothing ever hit the glass. It just always seemed to hit the hood and the, around it. So there was no glass being broken, but you could hear the thump, 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 and all that kind of stuff going on. We kept on driving. Sheriff Chapel was standing there, and we drove up right next to him. He came over and grabbed the door and yanked it open and said, either get out now or get the hell out of here. When they said we're going to integrate the school, we felt like we was already integrated because we knew what Cornelius stood it for. We knew what it was all about. We knew that you had the support of Cornelius, you know. <laughs> and not just the, the black that was at Cornelius, you knew you had somebody white that was on your side and that didn't mind speaking up. It was very difficult and we all carry a lot of scars from it. But like I said, interestingly enough, not anger and the fear that I've carried, I've had, I've, I've forced myself to face whenever it comes up. I got beat maybe five, six times. Here in Chris County is where, and Baker County is where I suffered the more beatings. They began to stomp me, beat me, and, and all my face was just busted up, and my head was busted, uh, skull cracked. And they said, oh, this that nigga from Sumter County. Veterans of the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s still call America's and Sumter County one of the meanest places in America during that time. We are not here to destroy the image of America's Georgia. We simply want to be free. Most people aren't aware of this, but, but in the summer of 1965, America's was as nationally notorious as Selma, Alabama. All the action was going on in Selma, Alabama and America's Georgia. Our troopers have been in America's now for almost two weeks, and they've done a very good job of keeping a very tense situation from developing into a human explosion. 
If it wasn't there's so many respects for Kananir, I don't think that the movement or something kind of would have ever gotten off the ground. Because we had nowhere to meet. We had nowhere to go. Uh, in terms of staff, we had to either meet at someone's home and our parents were too scared to have us meet there. So then we went to Kananir in sheer fright. What was happening at Kananir was virtually, was happening in a vacuum. And it was, it was the backwater of the civil rights movement. And it still doesn't have its place in history and I don't suppose it ever will. They were not trying to do anything other than prove that human beings can live together as fellow human beings without regard to race. And that was the unique thing about Koinonia that was different from the civil rights movement. Um, and I'm not saying the civil rights movement wasn't necessary, it was. But the, the difference, the why, was the difference. felt it was time to take part in one of the marches. And so I went out to Daddy, he was working out in the field, and I said, Daddy, I think I need to be a part of one of the, the demonstrations that's gonna go on to today or tomorrow, whenever. And uh, he said, why do you think that? And I said, I need to show support. I need to show them that um, I'm a part of it, that I'm doing something. And he said, well, this gets difficult for me. He said, well, he said, I could go out and I could shoot Sheriff Chapel. I would be doing something. But what I would be doing wouldn't be right. And he said, if you take part in that march, I'm not going to get you out of jail. You're going to stay there. He said, but if you and Lena, who is a black friend of mine, he said, if you and Lena go into Walgreens and get arrested, I'll go all the way to the Supreme Court with you because what you're doing is right and what should be done, but not when you get in the streets and march. And that was kind of his philosophy on life was that I will never step aside, but I will not create trouble. At the height of the Civil Rights Movement, Koinonia Farm had ground to a virtual standstill. Years of economic hardship and violence had reduced its membership to just two families by 1968. But that year also saw a new family, the Fullers, arrive at Koinonia. And with Millet and Linda came a renewed spirit to the struggling farm. We had just heard the name Koinonia. We didn't even know where it was. We were just coming back from Florida. We were taking a vacation. Uh, because we had made the big uh, decision in our lives to um, sell or give away everything that we had and, and start looking for a new direction in our lives. We had no idea what that would be, where we would go, what we would do. We just knew what we didn't want to do. We didn't want to continue pursuing the materialistic dream of getting richer and richer, uh, which was putting us in big houses and driving uh, big cars and and having horses and cattle and speedboats, uh, but tearing our relationship apart. We came just to stay like an hour or two to visit friends, but Al and Carol insisted that we stay for lunch because they had a community meal, and we were sitting at the table on apple crates, and in walks Clarence Jordan. Neither of us had ever heard of him. We knew nothing about him. Uh, he was a very ordinary looking person wearing uh, overalls uh, with brogan boots on, ruddy complexion. He looked like a typical South Georgia farmer, but he sure didn't talk like a typical South Georgia farmer. They were very affirming about what we were doing, uh, giving away all of our money. Um, they you know, said this is just what Jesus wanted the rich young ruler to do in the scriptures, whereas a lot of our family members and friends just thought we were ready for the nut house. We began to feel pretty soon after we got here that maybe God had brought us to this place.
Koinonia had been involved in a scandal in 1950 when they had brought a dark-skinned Indian man to a tiny all-white Baptist church. By the late 1960s, America was on its way to an integrated society, except, it seems, among the pews. Koinonia would once more prove to be a briar in the lily-white cotton patch. The First Baptist Church in America uh, was having their Christmas program, and they had invited Dr. Moore to be the preacher. Well, he came out to see his daughter, Carol, and uh, we had lunch here at Cornelia uh, that day, the day that he would be speaking that evening. And very Southern tradition, uh, when lunch was over, he said, well, I got to go now. Uh, as you know, I'm speaking tonight at uh, First Baptist Church in America. Y'all come. Collins McGee was among the Koinonia group who decided to attend the service. We knew that it would be a very volatile uh, situation, but it was a natural thing in the sense that we had been invited there. It was not contrived. The very idea, you know, of bring, uh, a black coming into the church, it just was un unheard of, just, just wouldn't be allowed. We walked on in the church and sat down. They were, they were singing, Peace on Earth, Goodwill to Men. So they looked back and they saw this, this black person there. So everybody in the pew in front of us got up and left. I do remember that they came in. I don't know whether they were ushered in or, or somebody ushered and had them seated. Then somebody else realized who was in there. And the usher comes down the Aisle, and he reaches over and grabs Collins McGee and says, you got to get out of here. They were very angry and they said, we don't appreciate you coming here disrupting our service. And we said, well, we were invited here. i never forget the usher kept saying, the government hasn't put any money in this church. This is a private church. This is our church. And Clarence Jordan said, uh, I thought this was God's church. And he said, that's beside the point. It is alleged that some churchgoers brought guns and billy clubs to at least one Sunday service to keep out black visitors. But First Baptist was not unique in its handling of black parishioners. Across the street at First Methodist, the members were just as adamant about keeping blacks out. To think that they would want to come to our churches is something we couldn't handle either. The church was ours. You know, you equate to it as like it's our house. An underhanded movement started to elect a board of deacons who were known to be no blacks. And uh, this petition, uh, well, a list, vote for these men. They won't let this come up again. My husband knew nothing about this until after the election. But when he heard what had happened, I. Uh, he was heart sick. This was such a powerful experience for us because we always thought of the church as a friendly place. And wow, we saw another side of the church that we didn't know existed. In the late 60s and early 70s, that was what we called the, the hippie period. Uh, heavy civil rights days, um, you know, a lot of young people wearing tattered jeans and guys wearing long hair. There were a lot of uh, young women that came down from the north. They were tired of the traditional institutions. They wanted to try new ideas. I guess early summer it was, in spring of 1969. We spent so much time, all of us as a group. I mean, we were together absolutely every day, be it five o'clock in the morning Bible study or lying under the stars. Among these new ideas at Koinonia was one that would make prolific builders out of what were once persistent briars. Initially, we were thinking about organizing a ministry uh, and it would be centered in Atlanta. We were going to sell Cornelia and uh, move. But, uh, there was a, a feeling that the work here was over. We hadn't been here many days until we began to realize 
why would we want to go somewhere else? This is a perfect setting uh, for what we wanted to do. Corn and Neil was looking around for a, uh, a mission. Uh, farming was no longer viable. So as they looked at the county and looked at the county's needs, housing just jumped at them. In 1968, Clarence Jordan and Millard Fuller marked off 42 half-acre plots on the northern edge of Koinonia Farm. Clarence had proposed a fund for humanity, which would buy and hold land for families to farm and build houses in partnership. It would be Clarence Jordan's final legacy. Clarence said, if you are going to be an authentic disciple of Jesus, you have to take Jesus seriously, try to understand what his message really was about, and incorporate it in our daily lives. And that is why we started building houses. That was a relevant need here in Sumter County. We built one house uh, for one family, the Johnson family. They were living in a shack uh, right up the road here, Bo and Emma Johnson and their children. Their house uh, was under construction when on October 29, 1969, Clarence Sturden, sitting in his little writing shack, he was writing a sermon, and he just uh, put his head against the wall, and, and God called him home. This is still really hard. I didn't know it was going to be this hard talking about it. We were like kids, saying, like, Dad, you can't go now. I mean, don't forsake us. Don't leave us. He always just said, God, let me die with my working boots on. In death, the local community treated Clarence Jordan as they had during his lifetime, with absolute contempt and disrespect. After an autopsy, hospital officials returned his body nude, his clothes tossed in a paper sack. Clarence was buried in a simple pine box, clothed in his overalls. And there were no authorities at his funeral, uh, no people of prominence. Uh, it was just the poor people from around here. He was, a, he was special. I don't think I've ever met anybody that uh, was, was down to help people like he was. And, and uh, all what they did to him, he didn't change and he didn't leave. He held on. Uh, I think he's one of the giants of the 20th century. I don't think history will capture that. I don't think there's any way for history to capture it because uh, the, the, the measures that historians would bring are not there unless you can track down the thousands and thousands of people whose lives were transformed by, by being around Clarence and, and learning from him. The Fuller family went on a missionary trip to Africa in the early 70s and put some of Clarence Jordan's Fund for Humanity philosophy into practice. Millard Fuller immediately grasped its global significance. This was the birth of Habitat for Humanity. Initially, when we got back, we thought about making the headquarters of this new entity, Habitat for Humanity, at Cornania. But the people who lived at Cornania uh, were very much into Christian community, uh, having meals together at noon and fellowship and a lot of discussion groups. It soon became clear that Millard's dream and his vision um, contrasted with that of the majority of the folks here. His vision was worldwide. Our vision has always been uh, limited to Sumter County. When Habitat first came to America, there was a fair amount of suspicion uh, about it because of its um, contact, I, I presume, from uh, Cornelia days and its roots. We were not welcomed um, here by the majority of the people. There were some that were very, very kind to us. It soon became evident after Habitat built a few houses and they traded with local merchants and they paid their bills on time. They definitely all displayed a, a Christian attitude that uh, most of the people in the community actually favored what they were doing. Thank you all for all that you do for our community. Whatever our community can do for you, we stand ready to assist. Thank you. 
when we really made a change in this community was when we built that headquarters in the Rylander building uptown. We became uptown folks. And we did that spending, you know, $4 million on that building. We had a lot of jobs here. Uh, we were building a lot of houses and creating a lot of taxpayers. It's amazing how people's racism and fears of the unknown can be put aside by economic benefit. So I had a friend who laughed and said, yeah, they don't see black and white anymore. All they see is green. From the briars of Koinonia sprang the bloom of Habitat for Humanity which at the beginning of the 21st century was one of the largest employers in Sumter County. The organization's economic impact is worldwide. There's a delicious irony here in that, in that we have these horrible race relations for forever, and then we end up, America is now known to people who didn't know it before as the place where Habitat for Humanity International is headquartered, building homes for everybody. Black and white people working together. Attitudes were changing when Jimmy Carter became involved in Habitat, but um, his entry into Habitat obviously caused it to have a world stage that it did not have before. This is my roof going up on my first home. <laughs> I just think how wonderful and how how much we've progressed. You still got people that don't like Habitat, but thank goodness that group is on the defensive now. They're kind of in the closet. So we've come a long ways. I couldn't praise this community enough. When you think about how divided the world was back in 1942 when Clarence Jordan started, Point in the end. We were badly divided along uh, racial lines. Do we have those same kind of divisions today? I think it's pretty much a rhetorical question because we're badly divided as a human family in so many different ways. A divided world seems far removed from today's Koinonia farm, where everyone pitches into work, whether in the bakery, the office, or the garden. Koinonia still operates a thriving mail order business, selling fresh Georgia pecans, fruitcakes, and homemade chocolate. Tour groups come through often to visit the farm, to learn about Clarence Jordan and the history of Koinonia. Koinonia Farm looks very much the same today as it did when Clarence Jordan was alive. I think Clarence Jordan's spirit is very much alive here. A new crop of volunteers have moved in, with 20 to 30 people living on the farm at any one time. Many come seeking escape from a materialistic society. Others seek an alternative Christian lifestyle. Some simply want to live close to the land. Then there are the next generation of Briars who are attracted to Clarence Jordan's pacifist beliefs. I came to Koinonia more out of an interest in social justice than I did in Christianity because I wasn't involved in religion at all at the time. At the time that Clarence Jordan was living here, civil rights was, was the major issue. We've moved into a new era, there's, there's new issues, and for a lot of us it's become the issue of peace versus war. No matter the reason, all who come to Koinonia are united by Clarence Jordan's powerful legacy of love, tolerance, and faith. That legacy is seen not only in the worldwide mission of Habitat for Humanity, but also in numerous other organizations, including Jubilee Partners, a small Christian community in Coma, Georgia, which has received thousands of refugees from around the world. I think in some ways, the reputation and influence of Clarence is growing. Once a person really comes to understand what Clarence Jordan was saying, uh, it's like when people come to understand what Jesus was saying. It's not uh, easy to forget it. The thing that made Clarence Jordan so innovative and courageous was how early uh, he performed his duty before God. This was 15 years or so before, you know, before Martin Luther King Jr. was even well known. And uh, there was uh, Conan Air with a kind of a beacon light for people who believed in racial equality. One of our biggest challenges, I think, is that we have become acceptable. When you become acceptable, 
you run the risk of becoming mediocre. Our greatest fear, I think, is that we would lose our prophetic edge and uh, we need to uh, fear mediocrity more than failure. Has Koinonia Farm really become acceptable or is it simply that this country over the past half century has moved closer to Koinonia's once radical notion of racial equality and harmony? America will always need briars like Koinonia to pierce our comfortable lifestyles and make us think carefully about where we're going. These briars in the cotton patch have successfully survived because, like it or not, we need them. I'm Andrew Young. Well, do you say that Koinonia then is a success or is it still growing or is it still in the formative stage or how, how is it working? We have not made success from a statistical standpoint our goal. We have made success from a spiritual standpoint our goal in that whether there is one or 100 or 1,000, we be faithful to these ideas to which we've committed ourselves. They will. 